was so excited to have the opportunity to meet with and debrief one of the CIA's best sources being run out of Baghdad Station. This individual, we'll call him Mansour, was the emir or leader of an al-Qaeda in Iraq cell that had taken over a village west of Baghdad and was terrorizing the local population. Mansour was interesting because he got to a point where he no longer bought into al-Qaeda's ideology or behavior. So he did the unthinkable. He decided to turn against the other members of his cell and partner with the CIA to give us the intelligence we needed to take those bad guys out. And after about six months of reporting, we did just that. Coalition forces were able to successfully action our CIA intelligence and were able to remove the bad guys who were terrorizing the local civilian population. There is no better vetting than that. And so I'm not just fascinated by that part of Mansour, but also a little bit more of his background. When he first came to us, he really got our attention because he said, I was a member of Fedayeen Saddam. Now, Fedayeen Saddam was one of the most feared groups that Saddam created in order to keep people in line and keep people under his thumb. Fedayeen Saddam, loosely translated into English, means Saddam's defenders. And these guys were drawn from the tribes most loyal to Saddam Hussein. And they happily killed, maimed, and tortured to keep people in line. And that's how Saddam stayed in power for 24 long years. So I'm thinking to myself, who does that? I am fascinated by human behavior, and I always have to understand, why do people do what they do? What makes them tick? So a chance to meet with somebody like that, up close and personal, face to face, was about the most exciting thing I could think of. I get to meet a terrorist for myself. <laughs> kind of sick, right? <laughs> Um, so we're preparing for our first meeting because the regular handling officer is overseas, and so we drive to the secret pickup location and stop the car, and Mansoor emerges from the shadows. We open the door, he climbs into the back seat of the car, and we drive away. And we go to what we call the ops pod, which is the places where the CIA officers met with and debriefed their sources. And we met with him for about two or three hours, and then when we were finished, we dropped him off at a different location. He went about his business, and we went about ours. So as I'm walking back into the CIA compound in the green zone, I should have felt really good about myself. I carried out a safe and secure operation. It was actually quite textbook. I had pages of notes that I was going to be able to turn into intelligence reports. And so I should have felt really good about it. But instead, I had this weird feeling that something wasn't right. Um, but I had a lot of things to do that day, so I just kind of shoved that aside and I went about my business. And then later on, the next day, as I was starting to write up my cables back to CIA headquarters about the meeting with Mansoor, this weird feeling started sprouting up. And it was like an intuition that something was wrong. And it would not let me go. It irritated me, and I could not reject it. It just kept spurting out within me, and so I finally decided to just go with it try to wrap my head around what my brain was trying to tell me. And so I carefully reviewed this entire meeting from beginning to end and everything in between. And after struggling with this for literally days, I finally had a moment where I was like, the light bulb came on. And I said, I don't think Mansoor is who he says he is. Why? There were things about his behavior that really irritated me. So when he came out of the shadows to get in the car and I first laid eyes on him, this is what I thought. Really? This is the kind of guy who cracks skulls? He was tall and thin and wiry. And I chided myself because I was like, Michelle, you can't judge somebody on the package. You hate when people do that to you, so you shouldn't be doing that to him. And then I thought about, you know, he got in the car, he got in the back seat, and as my colleague drove away, I turned around to greet him in Arabic and shake his hand. And something about that bothered me too. His hands were cold and clammy, and he was shaking, his whole body was shaking. And I actually thought in that moment, I think he's going to pee his pants. 
And um, it, was a very, it wasn't a firm grip, it was a very loose grip. And I'm thinking, really, that's all you've got? <laughs> And then I'm thinking about the totality of Mansoor's personality during that three-hour meeting, and I finally realized and could put it into words what had been bothering me for days. Mansoor didn't have an ego. I had met with so many terrorists, and they have different backgrounds, different personalities, different roles in the group, but I'll tell you one thing they had in common. They had enormous egos. These guys would walk into a room and literally fill it up. You talk about swagger, you talk about cocky, that was them. And Mansoor was like the opposite of this. And so I recognized that my subconscious was throwing up red flags that I needed to investigate. And so over the course of several meetings, I employed a very strategic debriefing process to really dig down into who Mansoor really was. And do you know what I found out? He was never an emir. In fact, he was never the member of a terror cell. He was able to give us this amazing intelligence because, as it turns out, everyone in the village knew who Al-Qaeda was. Even Mansoor's 10-year-old son could have told us this. Because unlike in other parts of Iraq, it wasn't this deep, dark secret who the bad guys were the whole village knew. So Mansoor gave us that information not as the penetration of a terrorist group, but as a concerned citizen. And then we were so wildly successful in our counter-terror operations that he essentially worked himself out of a job. And he needed to feed a family of 10, so he needed to keep a good thing going. So Mansoor did what he had to do. He turned to fabrication. And for six to eight months, Every bit of detail he provided was completely made up. Now, I have empathy for Mansoor because if I were him, I might have done the same thing. But I'll tell you why that is really bad for us. Every time our military colleagues rolled off a military base, there was a strong chance they might not come back again. There were IEDs, car bombs, snipers, insurgents, and attacks going on all over Iraq that were killing and maiming our soldiers every single day. It is not okay to put out fabricated information for six to eight months, which is not real intelligence, and to put my colleague's life on the line. I realized that day how very critical intuition was to operations. And that was further reinforced by a whole other story, which is a completely different context. I was asked to provide an independent review of a case that had been going on for quite a long time. Seemed like everything was going very well, um, but I was to go in and have like a seven hour, seven, eight hour meeting with this guy, we'll call him Sam. Sam wasn't a terrorist, but Sam lived in a country that was run by a dictatorship. And Sam had been providing information on that government's plans and intentions so we could adjust our policy accordingly. And Sam was really interesting. I mean, everything went well in that meeting, but when I went back to the hotel, I had one thing in my head, and here's what it was. I don't like him, and I don't trust him. Why? You could have given me a million dollars to tell you and I couldn't have produced or articulated why I was having this response to Sam. And so, once again, I thought, okay, maybe this is an intuition, it's a hunch, whatever, I need to go with it. And so it took me about a week to figure this out. And it was a very deeply intellectual exercise. Because again, as I'm reviewing my notes, it's like a textbook operation, a textbook meeting. All looked really well to everyone, and it was a really good case. So what bothered me about Sam? Well, here's what it was. Here's what I finally figured out after a week of literally pulling my hair out and banging my head against the wall. Sam had no passion. I could not see the humanity in him in those seven hours. I gave him about 10 different ways I've asked this question, why are you doing this? And I gave him opportunities to explain to me why he was putting it all on the line to work against a dictatorship. And you know what's disturbing about that? He's not only risking his own life, but he's risking the lives of his wife, his children, his colleagues, and really everyone near and dear to him 
because if he was ever exposed and shown to be a CIA spy, he's not only going to be killed, but he's ruining the lives and the future of all those people that he loves. So if you can't tell me in seven hours why you're passionate and why you're working against the interests of your government and why you're putting it all on the line, that's a problem. And I finally was able to pull it out, and this was what I theorized. I think Sam could be a double agent. Now that was very unpopular because the case had been going quite well, and nobody wanted to hear this. But guess what we found out years later? I was correct. Sam was a double agent. My intuition was right on. Far from being this magical or mystical concept, I found that intuition was the product of very rich human experience. And it's not just critical in intelligence, but anytime you're dealing in people and operations, your intuition is one of the best tools in your operational toolbox. Why? Because it's often the first uh, indicator or red flag when things aren't going well. It allowed us to course correct when we were going in the wrong direction with these sources. Your intuition needs to be discussed in the workplace because it's a very real skill. And it can mean the difference between failure, mediocrity, and wild success, because the intuition is your brain that is moving so efficiently and quickly and arriving at a destination before you can consciously keep up with it. It's the product of all your experience. So the more time you spend developing your trade and your craft, the stronger your intuition is going to be. So because of my CIA experience, I am a very strong believer that we need to bring the conversation about intuition into the workplace with HR, with corporate management. We need people to understand what it is and help develop it. Because when you hone that skill and you're able to apply it in your everyday work, it can make an enormous difference. And that is an idea worth igniting. Thank you.